This is a service in which we praise God, glorify Him, and thank Him. But primarily, it's a place where the gospel is proclaimed and where commitments are made, lifetime commitments are made to Christ. And there are hundreds of people here tonight that stand at the crossroads of your life. You're not here by accident. You might have come out of curiosity. Some of you came out of curiosity because of what you've read in the press or you've seen on television or because of this new dome stadium. Whatever your reason, maybe someone brought you, invited you to come. But you're here and this may be the greatest and most important moment of your life. And for some of you, it will become the most important moment. As you listen to God's voice, you'll hear my voice through your physical ears, but you'll hear the Spirit of God through spiritual ears that God has given you. Our Father and our God, we thank thee for these that thou hast sent here tonight. And we pray that all of those whose hearts you have already prepared may respond and say yes to the claims of Jesus Christ. For we ask it in his name, amen. I want you to turn with me to Luke's Gospel, the 10th chapter. The 10th chapter of Luke's Gospel, if you have a Bible with you, beginning with the 25th verse. I want to ask how many here tonight, you're under 30 years of age, stand up. You're under 30. There's nobody left to applaud for you. you may sit down. It's interesting uh, as we go back through the years and uh, see the vast change that has taken place in these crusades because it used to be that the vast majority of people were middle-aged. That was uh, when we first came to this area for a crusade. We were here six weeks in the stadium. And uh, the average audience at that time would have been middle-aged. Today, night after night, it's young people. And it's the youth all over the country that are searching, searching for something to believe in. I was talking to the president of Harvard University a few months ago. And I asked him what the greatest need at Harvard was and among students today that he found, and Dr. Bach said, the greatest need is commitment. And the greatest need in your life is commitment. And tonight I'm going to ask you to make that commitment and make it to Christ. So let's turn to this simple little story that most of you have heard since you were children, perhaps, this story. Beginning with the 25th verse of the 10th chapter of Luke's Gospel. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered, said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he, the lawyer, willingly to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Who is your neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I'll repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And the lawyer said, He that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Now Jesus gave this little story 
an answer to uh, two questions posed to him by this lawyer. Master, what shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? Now, the first mistake the lawyer made was there's nothing you can do to inherit it. You cannot inherit eternal life from your parents or your grandparents. You could say, I was born in a Christian home, but that doesn't make you a Christian, or born in a Christian community, but that doesn't make you a Christian. You could say you were born in a garage, but that doesn't make you a motor car. <laughs> now, the second question he asked was this, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Now, there are three things wrapped up in that question, who is my neighbor? First, it was a social question. Who is my neighbor? We could go to New York and you... And when I tell people this all over the world, wherever I go, usually at some clergy meeting, they're quite shocked and surprised when I tell them that New York is one of the largest Italian cities in the world. It is the largest Jewish city in the world. It's the largest Irish city in the world. It's the largest Spanish, one of the largest Spanish-speaking cities in the world. And it is the largest black city in the world. And throw in a lot of Norwegians and Scandinavians and people of Russian descent and people from all over the world in New York City and you have a United Nations living under one mayor and one government and I wonder that they get along as good as they do. It's amazing to me when I go there that they don't have more fights and more murders. They only have five murders a day in New York. And uh, when you read uh, who all lives there, who is my neighbor? My neighbor is the person who is close to me, of course, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, roommate, husband, wife, mother, father, person next door, your professor, your friends. But today we must take a wider look because of modern communication and modern technology. The whole world has become our neighborhood and everyone is our neighbor that lives on this little planet because we are a small planet and we have technology in our hands now that have made this a very, very small planet. And we are demographically moving closer and closer to each other and we've become a neighborhood without becoming a brotherhood. And this is one of the great problems that we face in the world today. And Jesus said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and strength and mind and thy neighbor as thyself. You are to love the people of Africa. You are to love the people of the Soviet Union. You are to love the people of China. You are to love the people of Latin America. You are to love the people of Europe. You are to love all of those people. You say, but there are some of those people I don't even know. But we are to love them and we are to pray for them. Pray for the whole world every day. And so this story teaches many things. And one is about relationships. There are several relationships in loving our neighbor that I would like to mention tonight. The first is the race question. I remember back in the early days of the 1950s uh, when we were just starting, Drew Pearson, who was a columnist, a famous columnist in this country, wrote me a letter and he said, Billy, he said, would you uh, be willing to go to Clinton, Tennessee? That was the first incident, big incident we had, racial incident, that we had in the 40s and 50s was in Clinton, Tennessee. He said, do you have guts enough and courage enough to go there and preach to an integrated audience? And I said, uh, yes, I do, if you'll go with me. <laughs> and he went with me. And I remember Senator Kefauver and different ones of the Senate were there and they sat on the platform. And the head of the White Citizens Council had declared that he was going to blow up the meeting or he was going to stop the meeting or he was going to do something that it would never be held. The meeting was held, the gospel was preached, and one of the first people that came forward to receive Christ was the head of the White Citizens Council. And from then on, he found out that he was to love the black man and that he had a responsibility in this race question. And you see, the story of this good Samaritan is really a story about a race question because the Jewish people of that day had very little to do with the Samaritans. They were of a different ethnic background. And this is a story that Jesus tells directly to teach who our neighbors are. Our neighbors are people of a different race or a different cultural background, and we're to love them. 
when Jesus went back to his hometown in Nazareth, he was well received until he spoke about the race problem. And when he spoke about that, they tried to stone him. And then secondly, there are the rich and the poor relationships in the world today. The rich nations, the poor nations, the rich people and the poor people. In James 2 it says, Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. And we read the statistics pouring out about 60,000 people a day starving to death. Or one billion in the world today who are on a starvation diet. And then we read about all the money we spend for dog food in this country. And then we read about all the money that we, all the garbage that we waste. Have you ever gone to a McDonald's hamburger? Or to one of these other places or Wendy's or someplace? That's where I eat so much of my, spend so much of my time. And uh, you eat in the automobile and then you see them as they put it in the garbage. Now most of them eat everything but the paper. But the french fries and some of those other things, they go in the garbage because I don't want those maybe. But anyway, you watch people or you go to garbage cans and I've talked to garbage men who tell me what they find in the garbage cans. And you could take our garbage in America and feed a great deal of the world. You see, and we spend so much on dieting in this country. You know, we're all getting too fat. And in much of the world, they're trying to start eating and we're trying to stop eating. And somehow there's an inequity in the world that we have to face. Now, the gospel of Christ has no meaning unless it is applied to our fellow man who hurts and is in need. And I would like to ask you a question tonight. When is the last time that you shared your life with another person or someone of another race or your material goods with the poor or your knowledge with those who crave knowledge or your skills with the untrained you stop to teach them what you know and then thirdly there's the relationship with the opposite sex that's an important relationship for young people that just stood up a moment ago I heard about a 13 year old girl whose mother took her aside and said, Honey, don't you think it's time that we talked about uh, the facts of life? And the girl said, I sure do, Mother. What would you like to know? <laughs> now, instant sex, we're told, is in while enduring relationships are downplay. Now, this was a problem in the oldest book in the world, Job. And Job said, I've made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I look with lust upon a maid? The Apostle Paul told young Tim Timothy to flee youthful lust. Peter said, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Now we say, there you go. There's God again telling us we can't have a good time. No, God is not saying that. There's nothing wrong with sex. We're all here tonight because of sex. And uh, it's a wonderful gift of God. God gave it to us. But we're to use it properly. He meant it was to be used within the confines of marriage. And he says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Why? Because he doesn't want you to have a good time? No. To protect the marriage. If you commit immorality before marriage, it affects your marriage. My oldest son-in-law is a psychologist and he's told me how many people with guilt, you know, uh, there was an article in the paper, I think, just two days ago about how many women in America commit adultery. Over 50% of the American women admitted to committing adultery. And yet 70 or 80% said they feel guilty. Now, why do they feel that way? There's something in their conscience that tells them it's wrong. And they suffer. And many of them have to go to psychiatrists and psychologists or to a clergyman or to someone and, and talk to them about this guilt. And then God said that to protect your body. We thought we had all the venereal diseases licked with penicillin. Then comes along herpes simplex 2. And many articles are appearing about it. It's like a raging plague through the population. There seems to be no cure. And just when it seemed that the pill and sex education and other methods of contraception were giving us a new freedom, then there suddenly appears this disease with no known cure. 
It's estimated that in less than four years, nearly one half of the American population will be infected. Time magazine, in its article on this disease, quoted a career woman in New York, an artist, who said, we're all looking for someone to love. And in this world, our chances seem slim anyway. Then you add herpes and you think, why should anyone want me now? A doctor in New York says that as the stream of teenagers come in to see him, they cry and then they exclaim, no one will ever want to marry me. A professor at Georgetown University was quoted as saying that herpes has inflicted intense guilt feelings among women especially, and again and again they cry, I'm unclean. So the age of guilt is back, and with a vengeance. And this time around, it seemingly has no immediate answer. Then there's another new disease, AIDS, and we don't know very much about it. I watched a, a show just a few nights ago, I think it was on Nightline with Ted Koppel, in which he was talking about this and all the terrible things that follow as a result of this disease. And then thirdly, God says, thou shalt not commit immorality to protect you psychologically. There was a girl from one of our great Eastern institutions quoted in one of the magazines some time ago saying, after I've had a sex experience, I always feel guilty. Why? Deep emotional disturbances, insecurity. They often feel unloved. Well, there are many relationships I could talk about that involve us in loving our neighbor, trying to protect our neighbor, trying to help our neighbor. I could talk on parent, daughter, and son relationships. The Bible says, honor thy father and thy mother. But young people have a hard time forgiving their parents. They forget what an agony and what a burden their parents carry for them. And parents sometimes forget that they were once young themselves. And there should be a bridge. And the bridge can be Christ. Because Christ can help you to forgive. As Christ forgives you of your sins, you can help Christ can help you to forgive your parents and help you, parents, to forgive your children and to love them because they're the closest neighbors you'll ever have. And they come under this when Jesus said, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. We could talk about the international relationships under this business of neighborhood. Probably the greatest social and moral problem facing the world today are the weapons of mass destruction. We look at the Middle East at the moment with its explosive situation there and some small country could fling a bomb and start a chain reaction and a great part of the world could be burned up. I'm writing a book right now on the four horsemen of the apocalypse and I've been working on that chapter that has to do with war and how the scripture teaches that there may come a day when man will destroy at least a fourth of the human race and you know it was interesting that a Russian scientist this past week used that exact same figure. About one-fourth of the human race, he said, in an atomic exchange would be destroyed and many others would be injured for life. And what a horrible thing as we look forward, and I've heard scientists say that it's possible to destroy the whole planet in a matter of an hour. But be that as it may, We have to face the fact that, that unless we become a, a, a brotherhood in our world, we may destroy a great part of the world. Now, I want to say one other thing, as I'm going to talk about tomorrow afternoon. God is not going to allow the human race to destroy itself. People that go around preaching all this doomsday business of total destruction, that's not taught in the scriptures. The scripture teaches that God has a plan. And the plan is that Christ is to return and rule and reign and the kingdom of God will prevail. And the prayer that he prayed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is going to be answered. The Messiah is going to come. Now there may be terrible judgments sweep the world. There may be terrible things come out of all of this technological business that we're creating because of the human heart. You see, the atomic bomb doesn't explode itself. It's man that it built it and it's man that explodes it. So the problem is man, not the bomb. 
Let's change the man. And that's why Jesus said, you must be born from above. Now I want to get back to this story before my time is gone. Some of you are watching by television. And there's a number there that on your screen, you can pick up your phone and call and talk to a counselor standing by in various parts of the country right now. And they will talk to you. And if you get a busy signal, call and call and call again. And they will help you in your need of Christ, your need of God, or some spiritual problem that you're facing. Now you notice in this passage, Jesus said, a certain man. Jesus believed in the worth of the individual. And Jesus spent most of his time with individuals, not just great crowds. And it's always the individual that he was concerned about. He said that he sees the sparrow fall. He has the hairs of your head numbered. And I wonder how many of us have ever thought about counting our hairs of our head. Now, I fortunately have a pretty good head of hair. I read in the paper that I wear a hairpiece. I do not and never have, but, and um, you can come pull on it if you want. And uh, have you ever tried to count the hairs of your head? Now, some of you, it wouldn't take very long. But some of us would take a bit longer. But the Bible says that all the hairs of our head are numbered. God numbers them. He not only knows all about you, he knows all about the hairs of your head. He sees the sparrow fall. Jesus said a certain man. The Bible teaches that God loves you as an individual. You are not just a person lost in a crowd here tonight. You are an individual before God. People talk about mass evangelism. This is not mass. Anytime you get two or three people together, that's mass. And if you get 5,000 or 10,000, that's mass. And you get a little bit more, that's mass. But we're individuals. And you're standing or sitting before God tonight as an individual, not just someone lost in the crowd. He sees you as though you were the only person living tonight. And Jesus said a certain man. He loves people, and Jesus hugs us one by one because he loves us. And greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, and while he was on the cross, he was thinking about you because he was God. He could look down the centuries and call you by name on that cross and say, I love you, I will forgive you if you will come to me. And then the man in our story was on his way to Jericho from Jerusalem. Now, Jericho was a border city, and it was a center of black marketing and crime and international bandits. And the road from Jerusalem to Jericho in those days was called the Bloody Way. But it was also a great city of priests. And it says a certain man, this certain man that Jesus is telling about, fell among thieves, which stripped him of his clothes and wounded him. Now, all the world is a bit like that. Sin is rampaging through the world. It's ravaging humanity, violence and terrorism, robbing and raping and all the things that we read about in the newspapers and all the things that we do, the little things that are called sin in the Bible. So that the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us are lawbreakers, and that's what sin means, the breaking of the moral law of God. And we've broken God's moral law. Now these thieves wounded and stripped this man and departed, leaving him half dead, alone and forsaken. He was knocked out and when he came to, he was crushed and broken and unable to move himself. And the scripture says that you and I are that way. Sin has made us dead in our trespasses and in our sins. The scripture says she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. You see, that means that you can be alive physically, but spiritually, your soul, your spirit that lives inside of you, that's the part of you going to live forever. That's the part of you that dreams and thinks and the real you that's going to live forever. That part of you is dead. It's dead toward God. You don't have any desire to read the Bible and pray and witness and live a good life. You have a desire sometimes, but you're unable to do it. Why? Because your soul, your spirit is dead. It needs to be made alive. And that's what Christ can do tonight. He can make it alive. He can take a dead person here tonight and make you alive. Now there came along some what I call salvation quacks. The world is full of false 
messiahs. There are over 400 people claiming to be Christ in Los Angeles alone, I read some time ago. I don't know how many in Tacoma or in the state of Washington. C.S. Lewis, the great professor at Cambridge or Oxford, he's taught at both universities, once said, all religions are perversion or a preview of Christianity. Jesus said, take heed that no man deceive you. We have a lot of deceivers now. He warned that many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. Paul said, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So there came by a priest. Now, you'd think a priest would certainly help a man that's broken and crushed and knocked out like this man was, but he passed by on the other side. He probably had a religious conference he was going to, a very important wedding that he had to perform, I don't know. But he re represented religion in all of its forms. And Paul wrote to Timothy of those having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And I want to tell you this, religion doesn't save anybody. Religion is man's attempt to reach God. Christianity is God's attempt to reach man. There's a vast difference. Jesus said, Ye are they which justify themselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Oh yes, we can be religious leaders, but be insincere. And I told the other night about uh, the bishop of a church that asked to see me and he said, I'm a, I have a doctor's degree from the university, I'm a bishop in the church, but he said, I really do not know for sure that I know Christ. And he knelt down and he wept and accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior and he was sure for the first time in his life. He'd had to become like a little child all over again. And there are many of you like that that are in the church and leaders of the church, but deep in your heart, you're not sure how you stand before Christ. Then it says a Levite came by. He stopped and looked at this uh, man and passed by on the other side. Now this Levite represented the law, the Ten Commandments. People say they can be saved by doing the best they can or by keeping the law. A poll was taken recently in New Jersey that said 92% of the people said they hoped to go to heaven but most of them were unsure. They were not certain. Now, the Bible says you can be sure. You mean to say, Billy, that I can know that I'm saved? I can know I'm forgiven? I can know I'm going to heaven? Yes, you can know it. Paul said, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. John said, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know it. And it's a wonderful thing to walk down the street or to go to bed tonight and know that every sin is forgiven and that if you died during the night, you're going to go to heaven. How? Not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saves. I'm going to heaven because of the mercy of God. I'm going to heaven because of the grace of God. I don't deserve it. I deserve judgment in hell. I'm a sinner like you but I have repented of my sins and received Christ into my Savior and I'm trusting in the cross of Christ. So the wounded and the derelict man was left to die. The priest and the Levite, unable or unwilling to help him. Then there comes a man along with, from another race, another religion, and he could have felt no responsibility at all, but he did. He was the Samaritan. He had compassion on him. A former prime minister of one of our countries recently said, I've never known such a time in his lifetime, in my lifetime, when there's such a shortage of love. I read of a woman in London who died at 102. And for the last years of her life, she had nightly made the entry in her diary. No one called today. No one loves me. She died alone. This Samaritan of another race, of another religion, went to him. He didn't just love him and leave him. Jesus doesn't just love us, but he died on the cross. And he died for us and for you. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. And the scripture here in this passage that Jesus is teaching says that this man went over and bound up his wounds and poured in oil and wine. But he did something else. God doesn't just convert us and change us tonight. 
But he goes with us. He keeps us. And brought him to the inn and took care of him. In other words, this man went with him to an inn, put him on his donkey. Peter says we're kept by the power of God. This Samaritan had his own ambulance with him, the donkey. Took him to the first good Samaritan hospital in history. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out money and gave it to the innkeeper and said unto him, take care of him. And whatever you spend, when I come back, I'll pay it. We sang tonight, or well, last night, the hope of tomorrow. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing and the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Christianity is good news, not just good advice. Good news that you can be forgiven, that you can have a new life, and that you can make a commitment to someone who will love you and go with you from here tonight to help you change your way of life. The Washington Post last year quoted James Russell Lowell as saying, Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side. Once in your life you have a moment to decide. Tonight is the night for many of you. And it may never come again like it is tonight. The scripture says, he that being often reproved shall suddenly be cut off and that without remedy. There comes a moment when you face God as you do tonight and you face the cross and you must decide. And I ask you to come forward in these meetings and stand in front of the platform and say symbolically by coming, I do indeed repent of my sins and receive Christ. You say, what do you mean by repentance? That word repentance means simply to change. You say, God, I have sinned. I'm sorry. I'm willing to change my way of life if you'll help me. I'm willing to change. Are you willing to say that? And then you come secondly by faith and put all of your confidence in Christ on the cross for your forgiveness and your salvation. And then thirdly, you're willing to follow him and you're willing to go back home and be a good neighbor. Are you willing to say that tonight? That's what it means. If you are, you can get up and come. Now, why do I ask you to come publicly? Because he said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me publicly before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. And it's always been interesting to me that every person that Jesus called in the New Testament, he called publicly. So I'm going to ask you to publicly do what we have seen about a thousand people each evening do since we've been here. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat right now in a moment and come and stand in front of the platform. And after you've all come and stood here, I'm going to say a word to you, have a prayer with you, give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. You can go back and join your friends. You get up and come right now. You can come with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or whole families can come together, but God has spoken to you. You get up and come. We're going to wait right now. No one leaving, please. This is a very holy moment in the service. And I'm going to ask everyone to be in an attitude of prayer as people come from everywhere. You may be in the choir and God has spoken to you or wherever you are. You get up and come. We're going to wait on you. As you can see, many hundreds are making their way forward to make decisions for Jesus Christ. You can do so too simply by calling the number on your television screen. Trained counselors are standing by ready to talk with you. If the lines are busy, just write the number down and call back later.
You that are watching by television can see here in the Tacoma Dome here in the state of Washington on a beautiful evening, hundreds of people coming from every part of this great stadium to make their commitment to Jesus Christ. You can make the same commitment where you are. Just pick up the telephone and call that number that you see on your screen. Make that commitment. It's my prayer that you will. And be sure and go to church next Sunday. And God bless you.